Good morning from Washington, D.C. It's about 8 o'clock Eastern Time, and here's an update of the program lineup. Next, a call-in program with journalists and brothers Christopher and Peter Hitchens. Christopher writes for Vanity Fair, Peter for the London Daily Express. The segment will kick off a week of call-in programs with media families. At 10.30, we plan live day-long coverage from American University's Lobbying Institute as lobbying professionals discuss their work on Capitol Hill. Looking ahead this evening at 6, the evening news from Moscow, a daily digest of national and international news compiled by Russian journalists. That's a brief update of the C-SPAN schedule. Next, the Tuesday morning call-in. Peter Hitchens, Washington correspondent for the London Daily Express. It seems appropriate with all our talking about D-Day to start off asking about a headline in U.S. News and World Report. Summer of discontent, 50 years after D-Day, Bill Clinton will find Western Europe disenchanted with democracy. Disenchanted with democracy? Um, do, or do they mean disenchanted with the United States? It's I, talking I, about Jacques Delors, the president of the European Commission, a crucial moment in the history of Europe. Well, um, I don't see it as a particularly crucial moment in the history of Europe. It's a, it's a moment when everybody is looking back at the moment to what were, in many ways, better times when the United States came as a friend and an ally and liberated Europe. But in terms of it being a crucial moment for democracy, I, f I feel that, uh, that that may be exaggerating things a little bit. Christopher Hitchens, uh, the article goes on to say, the revival of nationalism and ethnic extremism, the worst recession since World War II, Disenchantment with European unity and the crisis in Bosnia are casting a deepening shadow over Western Europe, democracy, uh, and other things, argues Delors. Everywhere is under threat. Sounds like one of those articles that writes itself. I, I don't know which one, which, oh, it's U.S. News? It's U.S. News. It probably did write itself in that case. What do you mean? Well, you know, got to fill up space somehow. Anniversary is always a good peg. Um, discontent is never wrong, after all. I mean... You, there's never been a summer of content that I can remember, or even a winter of one. Clichéd headline, boring intro. Um, Stage-looking picture. Sta Stage-looking picture. Another, you know, another day, another dollar at U.S. News would be my... What I like, um, and what I would have stuffed in that intro while I was doing my clichés, I'd, I'd, um, I'd have remembered to say, which this writer appears to have forgotten to do, that those were the days when everything was so simple and you know, the, the morality of everything was so clear, which is becoming a favorite trope of the moment. Of course, nothing was more controversial than the American participation in the Second World War. The, um, but let me just or, or argued over. The, nothing, uh, was le nothing was considered less simple and, and easy and, and morally clear than that at the time. Well, here's Time magazine. It's all the same story that everybody's writing. This is the man who beat Hitler. What do you think of all this time spent on D-Day? Well, I think it's well worth remembering. It was the one incident in recent history when we actually did manage to put the clock back, something I wish we'd do a lot more often. Uh, having been driven out of, uh, out of Europe in 1940 uh, in disgrace and shame, we actually came back and, and liberated it with American assistance. We couldn't have done it without American assistance. To, to call Ike the man who liberated Europe is perhaps slightly exaggerating his role, but I suppose under the circumstances you should, you should be allowed to uh, beat your own drum. I remember that your father was in the Navy. You lived in Portsmouth. Yeah, our father is in fact buried in the, um, in the precincts of the D-Day chapel, the chapel where um, General Eisenhower, as he then was, had the, the service um, before the decision was taken to, to leave Portsmouth and go ahead. Um, it was the only religious service that ever actually had to be held in secret. Yes. They were, oh, well, it was, it was before the invasion. Had it got out that such a service was taking place, it would have, it would have given away the, the, the fact that it was going to be the following morning. What did he die of? My, my father? Yeah. Oh, he died of old age. And, and um, what year? <clears throat> hang on, um, 1987. 87. Um, and he was involved in the preparations for the Dieppe parade, for example, which was the calamitous dress rehearsal for the thing, and actually had in many ways a very arduous war. His, his vessel... Um, was the one responsible for sinking the Scharnhorst, we're proud to say, on Boxing Day of 41. 43. 43, excuse me. Um, as soon one forgets. And on the other side of our family, our, our mother has ancestry in Central European Jewry, so there was every interest in not letting this anniversary slide. 
But um, I'm perfectly sure that in other countries the magazine covers are saying it was Russia that won the war, or it was really England that won the war, or it was secretly de Gaulle who won the war, and so forth. It's, it is, it's a slightly irritating to see the way that people um, reinterpret it. But I, I just like to go back to my earlier point about how simple everything was and how people have that kind of nostalgia. Anyone who reads up just a week's worth of American newspapers of that period will realize how, how extremely controversial and how right it was. There should have been controversy about it then. This, this search for, um, for a lost um, moral simplicity, I think, is, is worrying and deceptive. There's a front page story by Bill Schmidt in uh, the New York Times. And the headline is D-Day to celebrate <clears throat> and Britain's in the mood. They talk about John Miller, Glenn Miller's nephew, of uh, getting a thousand people at $37 a piece to come dance. And yes. let, me, let me read this quote because this is what I want to ask you about. It's from a Violet Wright, 68-year-old London woman, says, as hard as times were, it was such a wonderful atmosphere in those days. Um, and it goes on to say her toe tapping out the swing rhythm as she took in the scene, a reconstruction of World War II servicemen's canteen. Yes. Well, there's nothing like shared adversity for making people happy in a paradoxical way. And I think those of us who've actually been in circumstances where there's been danger, discomfort, and uh, the, the threat of worse danger and discomfort over the horizon, remember those times afterwards with much greater affection than, than we felt for them when we were going through them. And it, there's the, the few small war zones that I've been in, where I, I, I am now on better terms with the people I share those experience with than with practically anybody else. She went on to say, by the way, but things were so different back then too, weren't they? England used to be like a big international firm, and now, well, sometimes it seems as if the country has just gone into liquid, liquidization. Liquidation. Liquidation. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, if you read the Churchill Roosevelt uh, correspondence, you'll see that that's actually, this woman probably hasn't done so. Um, but uh, she's absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the most interesting front of that war and the most relevant one to our discussion, I think, is the, the front between uh, Britain and the United States, the long battle between Churchill and Roosevelt over who was going to get the, the, the British Empire and Churchill losing um, and spending more time some days fighting Roosevelt than uh, fighting anybody else. Um, the hinge event, um, as that woman has sort of grasped in a way of the war, was, was the entry of the United States onto the world stage as a, as a victorious imperial power and the collapse of Britain, which lost everything of its imperial dominion in winning the war um, and had to mortgage it to the United States in order to win. It's an extraordinarily dark way of looking at it. Uh, there were prices that had to be paid. Britain actually went bankrupt to all intents and purposes within about uh, six months of the start of real fighting. The fact that the United States was prepared to come in and supply us with the means of making war after that meant that the war could continue and Hitler could eventually be defeated, which would otherwise never have happened. You could concentrate upon the, the price which Roosevelt had to make Churchill pay, but he was largely having to make him pay it because of his own, the, the, the domestic pressure on him here. It's a way of looking at it which I think, which I think leaves out a lot. It was a tremendous rescue of a country which, which had very nearly been defeated. And I don't think that anyone doubts that Dunkirk was a, was a tremendous and catastrophic defeat, which we would not have survived without American help. Our two <clears throat> guests uh, are brothers, and this is uh, a week that we're having family connections. Tomorrow, Abe Rosenthal and his son, Andy Rosenthal. Abe Rosenthal, a columnist for the New York Times, and former executive editor up in New York, and Andy Rosenthal, the deputy bureau chief here in Washington. On Thursday, Daniel Wattenberg and uh, his father, who is, has his own television show, Ben Wattenberg, and also writes a column. And then on Friday, we have uh, a couple of uh, husband and, and uh, wife teams, Annie Grower of the Orlando Sentinel, and, uh, and uh, also her husband, Michael uh, Mossadig, uh, who is with the McNeil Air News Hour, Susan Schaefer with the Associated Press, and Charles Bierbauer, uh, the husband of Susan Schaefer, with CNN. Would be a good week to have uh, Robert and William Bennett as well, I would have thought. Why do you bring that up? <clears throat> because it's on everybody's front page? It went straight past my bat. I was thinking of Stephen Cokey Roberts. For some reason, their name is flashing to my mind. Or what about the Restons? There's all kinds, believe mm -hmm. it or not, that okay. you can keep on going. By the way, you've been here now nine months. Yeah. You've been here... Twelve years. Twelve years. You guys see much of each other uh, since you've been here? He's always out of town. His paper keeps him on the road. 
harassing the president. Oh, hardly. <laughs> the, the occasional trip's a little rough. What do, you, what do you think of the experience so far? It's absolutely marvelous. It's even better than I expected it would be. It's a marvelous country to travel around because there is always something surprising. And because it is so huge after the cramped uh, feeling that you get in Europe, that everybody's been everywhere before, you've been there and that everyone's jostling with their elbows to be in a country that's so spacious and has so many varieties in it so many different countries within one border is uh, is, is an amazing experience which i can't get enough of on this uh, tuesday morning may 31st by the way the house will be back on june 6th the week from tomorrow th there's a report in the u.s news that two road scholars are thinking about running for president two senators larry pressler Really? And Richard Luger. How extraordinary. Both Republicans. I just both brought, Republicans and... I brought that up because we want to ask you both and about uh, this story in U.S. News. and I'm not. I'm sorry. Uh, USA Today. Uh, Steve Comero used to be with the Associated Press, now with USA Today. Clinton carrying extra baggage. Another Rhodes Scholar there. He's on his way to Europe this week. Uh, avoidance of the draft weighs the president down. Look, um, I mean... I think, I think Clinton's original mistake almost, and the one that was the real clue to what sort of a person he is, was to miss the chance to say, look, when Ronald Reagan came into power, he said the Vietnam War was a noble cause. Um, I, by contrast, think the anti-war movement was a noble cause. He couldn't possibly have done himself any more damage by making that truthful statement. And uh, people who despise him uh, now would have respected him then, though they would have disagreed with him no less. No, but his problem is, that, is, is, is not that he was against the war, but that he was simultaneously against the war and looking after his future political well, career by trying to uh, avoid the draft without avoiding the draft. Precisely, but he couldn't even tell the truth about that. So it seems to me, well, I say, what do I say precisely? I mean, that isn't, uh, that's not really what's held against him, I don't think. Not that he tried to avoid the draft, but that he, he wouldn't say yes, and I'm proud that I did. Um, and I, there's... In some ways, it's unfair this keeps on coming up about Clinton. And after all, if it wasn't this, it would be something else. The fact is that he's the first president with no Second World War experience, so he's bound to look a little diminished by contrast. Let me ask you both. Do you think, is this being brought up by members of the press that he uh, avoided the draft and didn't serve? Or, or do, you, do you sense that the veterans are are spiking this? I think some people are very passionate about it. I've come across more than, more than one person in the past couple of weeks who genuinely feels uh, angry that a man with this background should be representing the United States at the D-Day commemorations. Uh, it's, it's a funny thing about President Clinton. He seems to arouse very strong passions among his supporters and among his opponents, and not much in the way of straightforward, middle of the rank liking. And there are some people, and as someone who was screaming and shouting at him at uh, Arlington yesterday, people who are prepared to do that uh, because they feel so annoyed about what he did and what he didn't do. Yeah, but these, those sort of people are the very people who clap their hands stupid um, for Ronald Reagan, who, who insulted the memory of everyone who died in Normandy by claiming to have fought in the war when he had not. Um, so on several occasions, and also claiming to have insulted also the memory of every Holocaust victim by claiming to have taken part in the liberation of, um, of the death camps and the, the sorts of VFW types who now curl their lip at Clinton and I curl my lip myself a bit about it because I think he should have had the guts to stick up for the anti-war movement, uh, put up with this from Reagan and, and uh, took part in the, in the process of defamation that they perhaps are now overcompensating for. By the way, the, one of the last times you were here you made a statement about Mother Teresa that's still being talked about. I bring it up because there's a lead story this morning in some papers uh, this has nothing to do with public policy, although mm -hmm. I'm sure some of the audience would like to talk about it. Pope rejects women in priesthood. Uh, is that a headline, really? It is, right here, on the front page of the Baltimore Sun. It's not even dog bites man. What do you think? Well, I mean, I thought I knew that. <laughs> but it's, it's a what, strong... It's what I think. At least, strong... at least, okay, I, I'm in favor of it for this reason. It means Mother Teresa can't become a priest. This, it's got that to be said for it. Why is it? It's got like not it. much surprise or headline course. What is it you have? You, you mentioned this before we started. You're, you're working on a movie about Mother Teresa? There's a program on uh, British television which also sells around the world, um, which is called Jacques and it's where um, inflated reputations or phony reputations are taken on. And obviously Mother Teresa is a very fat target for this program, and I'm making a Jacques about Mother Teresa's fronting for the savings and loan crooks um, being the official confessor to the Duvalier family in Haiti, covering up for the Albanian Stalinists, 
um, justifying the phalange fascists in Lebanon, um, ripping off the parishioners, all the, all the things that everyone doesn't know about Mother Teresa, you but ought to know, will, will be in this. the stake might perhaps be too good for her. I, yes, I think, I mean, if I was her, I don't believe in blasphemy, but she does, and I, I would be crossing my fingers all the time if I was her. Do you have any comment on your brother's feeling well, about Mother well, Teresa? Well, I, I just haven't researched her background so deeply. I, the, the, she must have some positive features, is my only feeling. The, uh, you were going to say? I'm, I'm, on the, I'm searching for them, but I haven't found any yet. I, in principle, um, I think it's true that everyone, there's a Spanish saying about this, every, every, everyone has some aspect of honor. It ought to be true. I've come across some people of whom it's difficult to prove, though, and she's one of them. I want to show you a photograph, see if it elicits any comment from you this morning in Newsweek. That's the face of for several decades of democratic supremacy in the House of Representatives, isn't it? Every seam and crevasse on that face tells a story of some horrible deal, some, some bit of log rolling, some committee appointment or other. Um, the face almost as eloquent as the face of Lloyd Benson, I think, if you want to. I find a, a, a growing sympathy. I, I, whenever I hear of a, a corruption charge, especially in a country which seems to be pretty endemically corrupt when it comes to politics, I think steel activity, that people are being, pe people are for some reason or other raising the topic of corruption because they want to get someone for other reasons. Endemically corrupt? I've, I've somehow or other grown up with the belief that especially American city politics have a certain element of corruption. Dead people voting, money paid for votes, things that we don't do in mainland Britain very much. Um, and I, I tended to think that people rather accepted that it went on. And that if, if that's all that Rustin Kasky is being accused of, then who's next? It, yeah, but he hasn't made this defense for himself, has he? No, he, say, he says he's not guilty. Yeah, but very often they do say, oh, well, they're just, um, they're just picking on me because I'm so pro-healthcare or something. There's a hidden agenda here. In this case, he just denies it. And um, perhaps because he's from Illinois, um, people, I think, are more, just more inclined to believe it must be true. You know, Chicago politics is renowned. It's used to scare children with to this day. Mary Jacoby, uh, <clears throat> in a publication that's owned by <coughs> some Brits, The Economist magazine, this is Roll Call, has a lead story here that says Congress has strictest ethics rules in the world according to a new Congressional Research Service study of 24 nations including Great Britain. Well I'm, I'm astounded. <laughs> That's all I can say about that. Why are you? Uh, anyway, well I, I, I don't know. This is of course a country in which the v most important thing is to be on the right side of the law, to have a good law lawyer, to get off, to be found not guilty, not to do the right thing. And maybe under, under those terms, they do have the strictest rules. Uh, I'm, I, I don't think that the, the, the kind of money which is available for political cam campaigns here uh, is available in Britain. And I think when you have that sort of money at stake, you get corruption. And I don't think that you could conceivably argue that this country had the strictest rules against it, unless you were reading them in a very peculiar way. <coughs> let, me just, let me just show you the, the, the headline inside, because it has a, a word there that I want to ask you about. U.S. should be most ethical country in the world, according to a study of 24 democratic nations. Great day for headlines, isn't it? <laughs> <coughs> My friend and sometimes uh, foe, Michael Kinsley, makes the very good remark, uh, Kinsley's Law of Washington, which is that the scandal is never what's illegal, the scandal is always what's legal. What, um, what surprised me the first time I ever came to Washington, and surprises me still, is how it isn't unlawful to give money to a congressman to vote a certain way. It's considered legal, it's considered legal to solicit the money in that way too. Um, thus, if that's legal, it's very hard to say what the ethics uh, are going to be. I think, I think a law co compelling uh, lobbyists to hand over their checks to congressmen and senators on the floor of the, of the two houses immediately after the votes in which they've obliged them would probably be a, um, a salutary one. Yes, and for the guys to go around with taxi meters on their lapels to click up the, the rate. By the way, it looks like some kind of battle, not ribbons, but <clears throat> something that would, you'd get in some kind of a battle on your, on your lapel there. Can you tell us what those are? <coughs> well, the, that's the um, shield of Bosnia. I don't know quite how they got the fleur-de-lis as their, 
as their um, emblem. It's a very ancient kingdom, Bosnia, as you know. Yeah. I, maybe in, during the Crusades, perhaps. Well, I what don't, about the other one? Um, the other one is, in a way, a battlefield decoration. It's a present from a wine waiter um, at a restaurant in Washington who I suppose was just impressed by my services to his industry and um, wanted to share. What motivated you to put it on this morning? Um, it was on when I grabbed my jacket and ran for the cab, thinking, Christ, it'll be 8 o'clock in a minute, and I mustn't let the airways be monopolized by the oh. Daily Express. There are a couple of, uh, he, that was a criticism of you. I'm afraid so. Yeah. There, there's a, a couple of editorials, lead editorials, and a couple of papers that are known to have liberal political philosophies, and I just want to read a little bit. This is in the New York Times. Have you seen this? The Reformer Vanishes. Um, instead of fighting to dismantle Washington's big money system, President Clinton has helped his party become its biggest beneficiary. Pledges to clean up the nation's campaign financing procedures notwithstanding, Mr. Clinton has expanded, uh, expended more time and energy courting well-to-do donors at fancy private receptions than prodding Congress to enact serious political reform. Well, quiet. And it, 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 it it's rather adds on to what I was just saying. He, they, they also have a list of the president's, they call it the president's helpers, Federal law limits individual campaign contributions to 1,000 and bars any corporate or labor union gifts. These rules do not apply to soft money given to the national parties. Here are some of the largest donors to the Democratic Party, July 1992 through March 1994. And they, I'll show the audience in just a second, it lists the first donor is Time Warner, Inc., $508,000. National Education Association, $339,000. Uh, the Massantucket... Uh, Pickwood Tribe, if I'm saying that right, 300,000? They're the gambling tribe. The gambling tribe. Archer Daniels Midland, 270,000. Carl Lind Lindner, uh, 250,000. Uh, why would the, the New York Times do an editorial like this that takes off after the Democratic Party? Well, that page has improved a bit since... Um, um, Hal Raines. Hal Raines started tightening it up. And he still knows where if he speaks, and he's a, you know, a Southerner and, a, I suspect, a Democrat himself. The time for that editorial, though, would have been um, about two years ago when the, that same page was calling Mr. Clinton the front-runner and urging him upon everybody. And the only reason he was the front-runner was because he understood how to win the money primary. And he'd, he'd gone and, and signed up all the heavy-hitting donors before a single vote had been cast. Uh, that's why they called him the front-runner. And I wish the Times had been as eloquent about him then as it is now, but at the time, the only person pointing any of that out was Jerry Brown, who was called a crank by the same paper in the same space. So I'm not particularly impressed. Who doesn't know that, in other words? Uh, <coughs> MCA, uh, they make movies, $250,000. The, the Walt Disney Company, $250,000. Uh, Communications Workers of America, 229000 Edgar Bromfman, who now owns 15% of Time Warner and is the feature by Ken Olada on the cover of the New Yorker this week. Any further comment on this? <coughs> Not really, no. Uh, the... <laughs> no, I think it does speak for itself, but I, um, the, there was also um, the matter of whether people who had worked with or for the president as advisors would, could carry on being lobbyists while they were still having White House neck tags. And there's been a lot of discussion lately about the <coughs> frequency with which they use the revolving door, people like Betsy Wright and others. Well, actually, there's a, the, the Washington Post has an editorial called Ins and Outs. Representative Frank Wolf, who's a Republican over here in Arlington, Virginia, has pointed uh, usefully, and he wrote an op-ed piece, to a weak spot in the disclosure and other rules meant to protect against conflict of interest in the conduct of government business. It involves the White House consultants who cluster around every modern president just as surely as does the White House staff because the consultants aren't government employees. They aren't subject to the same reporting and other such protective rules as the presidential aides. And they're talking about James Carville and Paul Begala and Mandy Grunewald. Yeah. This bother you? Well, it bothers me. A, a lot of things about, about the current White House bother, bother me. But what is particularly irritating is the way in which this was presented as some kind of new presidency in which these things wouldn't happen. Uh, anybody who believed that uh, must now be seriously dis disappointed. Those of us who thought, well, we've heard this before, feel vindicated. Allow me to plug my uh, upcoming piece in um, Vanity Fair about Clintonism. It'll be out in about a week or so. 
Well, I say that <coughs> you can... Um, this is what the June issue looks like. Yeah. You get the cover for this? Uh, not me, no. I think... You know, we, 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 it will soon be Mrs. Anassis, the late Mrs. Anassis, but I'm not quite sure what the one next weekend is going to be. Um, I, should, I should have had that at my fingertips. But anyway, re reviewing the, um, the Clinton take on Whitewater and everything else and trying to write against the new spin that, that's been put on it, it it's sort of hit me very solidly amidships that um, you can count on Clinton to change his mind on practically anything if a question of principle or difficulty comes up. And um, it doesn't matter whether it's China or Haiti or Bosnia or gays in the military or indeed campaign finance reform. But there's one thing to which he's absolutely solidly and consistently loyal, and that's a particular cabal of old mates from Arkansas most of whom have no obvious qualifications for the jobs that they've got or had when they've kept them well, and, not, and not had to resign. That's one thing on which he does not give in. It's one thing on which you can count on him to be solid and consistent. Unless they get caught. Unless they get caught. In, um, in which case, off they go back to Arkansas or, or whip rounds have to be held for their helicopter fares. Yes. Um, and to borrow a, a phrase of the, the appalling um, Reagans that he borrowed from the delightful Peggy Newton, where do we find such men? Where do all these Arkansans come from? What are you writing about? What are you sending back home? I, well, I've, I've recently had a, had a bit of a, a, a break from what I call Trousergate, um, concerned with more domestic things. We've just had the launch of the first British Trident missile from a, a British nuclear submarine off the coast of Florida, which I spent a lot of last week watching. Um, mainly, though, it keeps coming back to Mr. Clinton and his problems. And I rather expect that uh, Larry Nichols' reply to Paula Jones's lawsuit is going to be taking up some of my time later on this week. Uh, though today I expect to be spending most of my efforts on Congressman Rostenkowski. By the way, how do you think, you think this will play uh, back there? And this is Patty Davis, the daughter of Ronald Reagan, playboy coming out soon. I think it may, may this is rate, news rate, 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 a, rate a mention or two, yes. <laughs> Now, now, now that we finally get to see the picture. Is that a retriever? <laughs> it's a Labrador, actually. Labrador. Yeah. Good Labrador. Yeah. Do you have any comment on this? No, no. I, well, no, I don't. Is there a reason why you don't have any comment on this? <clears throat> no, there isn't even a reason I don't have any comment on this. We're going to go to the phones here in, in, in just a few moments as we um, kick off this week of uh, family connections. Just want to say something about Trouser Gate. Um, the Haldeman Diaries reminded me, which are, by, I've been reading all week, unbelievably interesting in the revelation of the mind of the Nixon Are White you reading House. the CD-ROM version or just... No, but I'm going to get that. I think I'm, this is going to finally convert me to, to the new tech. Um, it, it reinforced my resolution not to do any more Gates stuff because I, it, brought, it brought back to me William Sapphire's confession that it was he who um, came up with the idea of putting gate on the end of every minor scandal so as to make Watergate, which was a real scandal and very nearly a coup against democracy in America, um, look like just another scandal by comparison. And so I think a self-denying ordinance should, should be made by all, um, all journalists to be very careful with the gate suffix, unless they think they're onto something really major. And if you want to know what something really major is and refresh your memory after the terrible month, of euphemism and, and airbrushing that we endured after Nixon died. You should read the Hall of the Diaries and see what a very narrow escape the country had. Peter Hitchens, have you read them? No, I'm, I've, I've seen a lot of the extracts and I've been actually surprised by the amount of anti-Semitism uh, that they reveal, particularly. I, I too wanted, want to get hold of the CD-ROM version, which sounds uh, like, a, like an astonishing way of presenting a, a diary and one which other people will no doubt be following all over the place. As, as, as for all we the, knew about the anti-Semitism, though. We, we, well, it, it wasn't it wasn't perhaps as, as clearly known about and as, and as graphic as it as, as it is. It's pretty gross. Time. I mean, actually, th it was the the um, House Committee that Peter Adino chaired at the time had to keep on. That's what the expletive deleted stuff originally meant. There were things they didn't think the people could possibly face knowing about what the president said when when black or Jewish Americans were being discussed. It was a believing and practicing racist, and not a single person who wrote his, any of his obituaries or spoke any of his commemorations cared to mention the fact or, or, or even face it. We're going to go to the phones. Uh, before we do, just to pass on to you, here's a little story that some of you on the West Coast can read and you might see it in other papers. Written by Jane Hall, the New York-based uh, writer for the Los Angeles Times, and it says FX affects C-SPAN viewership. We pass it on to you because for 
some of you in about 1.1 million homes in this country. This will be the last day that you have the complete C-SPAN available to you. And if you have questions, don't panic. Don't call your cable operator until there's really a reason to. Tomorrow would be the day. If we're not there tomorrow, you'll know that something's happened. And if you see a thing called FX there, that means that it's uh, a new channel owned by Rupert Murdoch on your television dial. Uh, hopefully, we'll be back someday. <clears throat> and we sure appreciate your loyalty and your viewership. Uh, if you have a question about all this, why don't you give us a call during the working hours here at 202-737-3220. If you weren't informed of this in your bill 30 days ago, it won't happen. And uh, <clears throat> it's in an isolated area. There's a lot of little systems in Iowa will be off tomorrow. And we apologize uh, for the confusion on all this, but we thought we'd better pass it on to you. And if you have a question, again, call us. But uh, don't panic until uh, it is absolutely gone. And in most places, 99% of you will still have C-SPAN when you uh, turn on the dial tomorrow. Let's go to the phones. We go to Chesapeake, Virginia. First up, go ahead, please. Well, good morning. Morning. Um, I, I think this is an interesting way of getting divergent views by having a couple of brothers there. I've noticed that you've tried to get... Uh, Divergent views before and uh, ended up with two people who should have been opposed sitting there agreeing with, with each other. I wanted to comment about um, President Clinton's lack of military experience as a retired military person, and uh, I consider myself a, a moderate conservative Republican. Um, I just don't have any confidence that he believes in anything, uh, uh, particularly in, in foreign policy. And when I contrast him with Bush, who served, with Reagan, who I guess didn't, but at least believed in something and stood for what he believed in, uh, with Carter, who served, with um, Ford, who served, uh, I just don't have any confidence that he has a clue about using force um, not to conquer everybody in the world, but at least uh, in a way that uh, would uh, make us appear to, to uh, be somebody that, that the rest of the world would look up to. And I'd be interested in uh, the comments of your of your uh, guest. Peter Hitchens. Well, I, I'm inclined to agree. The, the, the defining moment for me of, of uh, President Clinton's uh, time in office will always remain the moment when news was brought to him at a conference with radio talk show hosts that Alexander Rutskoy had declared himself the alternative president of Russia. Now, anybody knowing anything whatsoever about the subject would realize this was an immensely serious and dangerous moment. The chief executive giggled and said, isn't this funny? And here was a man who simply did not understand. Now later on, after he'd been in the room with all his briefers and been told presumably who Alexander Rutskoy was and what it meant, he became very serious and grave. But I think this is a man completely without vision. Whether it's because he's never served in the military, I don't know. But I, I think that it, he, he covers up his lack of a world view with a tremendous amount of knowledge. And that is all he has. Well, I'm not a fan of the, of, the, of the president, but I don't think that's a particularly serious test to have failed. And it makes me really cringe to think of what Reagan would have done if that sort of news had been brought to him. And the, 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 um, the caller was, um, I think, wrong in saying about Reagan, uh, well, I guess he didn't serve. What, what I said earlier, what I would like to repeat, is that Reagan didn't serve, dodged it, and lied about it, and twice claimed to have been in uniform in the Second World War. And I've just noticed that the people who make this a test of Bill Clinton's integrity tend to be Reaganites and to have swallowed that appalling insult from him. Well, hang on, Reagan, now, the, was, the, Reagan was in uniform in the Second World War. He was, he was, he was, he, he he was in the Hal Lurch he, studios. He could barely see. And was, <coughs> and was there, therefore... I, I don't blame I, him for not I, being I, in I, uniform. I, I, I blame him... Let's, I, let's just I have a little bit of fairness. I don't blame him for not serving. I blame him for lying twice about having served. Um, the, the fell consequence of this, and the worst consequence I can see, is that President Clinton is over-impressed by callers like the last one, who are basically full of military bluster. And he's only too willing to oblige the Joint Chiefs when they tell him to do or not to do something, because he's terrified of having another row with the armed forces. And as a result, the, the um, whole principle of civilian control 
of the armed forces and the idea of a commander-in-chief as someone who gives orders and doesn't take them from the military has been abandoned by the president with, with I think, terrible consequences all around. Mount Laurel, New Jersey, you're next. Hi, I'd like to ask a simple question. Seeing that these two seemingly intelligent British men, um, what is their take on American health care? Um, kind of with a view in mind of what tried to be done in Britain by the British government. Thanks. Terrifying. Uh, it's it's the, the daily nightmare. Uh, Britain's health care? No, uh, the health care that you have here. I am, I'm, I, I'm constantly scared stiff by it. I can't believe that mercy has a price on it. And having grown up in, in a country where it is simply accepted that if you fall ill, you will be treated. And it's not a question of how much money you have or which credit card you carry. To be in a country where it's assumed to be natural that if you are ill, you will pay for it. And that if you were ill for a long time, you'll pay for it until you haven't got any money left is astonishing. Well, we're supposed to disagree, and we generally do. But I mean, I agree with all of that. This is a country where people are really frightened, including people very well paid, like myself, <coughs> of what might happen if um, they got sick or almost unthinkable. And I've known people get into real trouble with this. If, if two members of the family get sick at the same time, that's it. It could be the end. Um, there's only one principle upon which healthcare could possibly be founded, and that is you are treated according to how sick you are, and that's the main criterion. That isn't even mentioned in the healthcare debate now, as a, as a, even as the shadow of a principle. I, I cracked my ribs quite badly in, um, in the terrible snow in January, and I had to go to the emergency room. I, I, if I'd been m much worse off, it would have been insufferable to go through what I had to go through by way of credit rate checks, while I could barely speak before I was allowed into an emergency room where I had to share a bed with somebody else and then pay for that on top. It was unbelievable. It was a combination of some banana republic and, and, um, and, um, and, clip joint. and clip joint and moral blackmail. People get charged for the operating table, uh, uh, actually charged for the operating table, what must be the price of the table. I, I, you, you look at these bills. I went almost as soon as I came here to my neighboring hospital in, in Bethesda, suburban hospital, and they very kindly showed me the kind of prices people were paying for treatment. And they were ashamed of what they were showing me in many cases. They, they just couldn't, they, they themselves couldn't justify Try it. getting a lawyer if you, if you aren't rich as well. Even the president finds he's having difficulty with that. I mean, the, the most basic services, that's why I'm, um, that's why I'm a socialist. Mark, uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. I don't think it has anything to do with socialism. Any, any civilized country, uh, a, a, especially a rich capitalist country, should be far more concerned about health care. I think those Americans who live next to the Canadian border have realized that there is an alternative. Martinez, California. Good morning. Hi. Yes, it's uh, really interesting. I've long thought that it, even though most of the people in power in the United States are European Americans, shall we say, uh, very little awareness or uh, interaction with European sorts of systems and reality is, is ever allowed in this country. I mean, we don't ever compare ourselves, well, what are we, you know, doing compared to France or England? And it's kind of strange. But I also, I, I wanted to call and compliment Christopher for his book. I read uh, For the Sake of Argument and some of Blood and the other one. Uh, Did you come across it from Mr. Lamb's very good book notes show? Pardon me? Did you come across it by any chance from I'm trying to ingratiate myself here? Um, <laughs> Mr. Lamb's very coming. Mr. Lamb's very good book notes I, show. I always try to catch book notes, but I do miss it sometimes. Mm. And I um, but I caught you on NPR yesterday. I was on the phone actually, uh, when uh, they, they couldn't take any more calls and a woman had just called you supercilious or something and I want, I really want to get on and tell her to just try your book because I found it very uh, very uh, moral and very grounded in oh, uh, Well, I could have done with you yesterday. Thank you. Um, were you live yesterday? I was live on NPI yesterday. It was actually extremely, can I say? Yeah. Very interesting. I was saying that in debate with my friend Lars Eric Nelson of, the, of Newsday, he's a brilliant reporter, but rather soft on Clinton. <coughs> we were reviewing the presidency. I was being quite critical. Almost everybody who called up was a Clintonoid, which didn't surprise me particularly because of the NPR audience, but almost all of them drew attention to the fact that I was foreign born. And I was interested in this because in 10 and 12 years of attacking Reagan and Bush, many of the people who must have been thinking, if he doesn't like it, why doesn't he clear off back to him and so on, politely didn't bring it up, didn't make a big thing of it. Robert Novak did once. And that was about it. You mean that your callers didn't want your you to callers, clear out? Your callers generally don't, even when they're very angry with me. But all these um, NPR liberals did. And I thought it was an interesting uh, sign of the success of Clinton in appealing to the, to the provincial 
in the American mentality and of successfully making people um, uh, feel that way. Well, I'd, I'd, <coughs> I'd had never th thought that you could be a foreigner here for very long. It's a country in which you almost immediately be become accepted, whoever you are. If uh, an American came to Britain and started making criticisms of the kind that, that, that we make, I think he'd have a very hard time because we have real foreigners in England. Uh, if you're a foreigner, then you're a foreigner for five or six generations before anyone even dreams of accepting you. It's a big difference. I've noticed here that, that people simply don't have that prejudice against outsiders that we have. That's quite true, and, and, and a real tribute to the national manners, which is why I was so struck yesterday by this instant sort of resort to the provincial and the chauvinistic, which, um, well, I don't want to complain about it. Being English is not being an oppressed minority, exactly. I don't want to be sound self-pitying, but I was just struck by the way that that was the first thing they went for. Next call from one of the president's hometowns, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Good morning, Brian. Hi. Uh, thank you for C-SPAN, and also thank you for the nice bookmark from the uh, bookmark show. Thanks. I'm glad you got it. <clears throat> it's taken a little while. Uh, yes, yes, it did, but... Uh, Really, I, I was so thankful. I came in and I waved the envelope to my husband. I said, I made it, I made it, I made it. I didn't think well, I would. You know, I should tell you, but if you don't mind, let me just wait one second. Uh, w w for you folks uh, that don't know this, uh, w we offered, a, for the first 500 that wrote us, a commemorative bookmark on our five-year anniversary of book notes. And we didn't know whether we were going to get <clears throat> 500 letters or not. In fact, we got 9,000. And uh, in instead of... Uh, we, we sent everybody one. I mean, we weren't try there wasn't a trick to the 500. We had no idea how many would, would want it, and we had a bunch made up. That's why it took so long, but I'm glad you got it. Oh, well, thank you so much. You are, you, you are very, very nice. Now, Thanks. I Neither heard, one. let's see, I've got to separate the two. Christopher, I believe it was, who said a while ago, President Reagan lied twice about serving. That man was in the Air Force during World War II. I don't care what he did or did not do, but his vision, which should not be forgotten about, his vision is what kept him out. He had two, uh, I forget who the gentleman's names were. I, I saw it not too long ago in print. But if he had been allowed to be in active service instead of what he did back here in the country for this country he would have either killed somebody or gotten killed himself because of his lack of vision don't, don't for me. someone who is nearsighted i have always been nearsighted i can understand that <clears throat> very clearly i have often wondered what it would be like before i had my cataract surgeries I have often wondered what it would be like to have vision that you could see everything at a distance. Caller, let me ask you, though, this question. Um, are you critical of President Clinton for not having served? Oh, very, sir. That is one of the things that really irritates me about this administration. As Rush Limbaugh has said many, many times, this is the worst administration that times. we have had in 50 years. Okay, let you go. Mr. Hitchens, your response. The vision thing, a new take on the vision thing. I don't mean to be heartless about anybody's um, short or nearsightedness. Um, and I made no allegation that um, um, President Reagan had done anything dishonorable in not serving. I said he did something dishonorable in lying, in claiming to have served on active service and, to, and, and in lying about having helped to liberate the uh, concentration camps. That's an extraordinary piece of fantasy on his part and an insult to those who did take part, and, uh, and forgiven him by the sort of people who quote Rush Limbaugh when they're reaching for authority. I'm we very sorry we, to say. We care about these things because we think that military service and exposure to fire is a test of character and a, and a fairly reliable one. I think one of the things that you can say about Ronald Reagan is that he is a man of physical courage. After all, he made his living as a lifesaver. And that's not something which, which involves standing by and letting things happen. As to, uh, as to his short-sightedness, I, I don't think this is widely known as it, as, as it should have been, but it's certainly incorrect to say that he didn't, he didn't serve or to mock him for, for, for a lack of courage. Abe and Andy Rosenthal, father and son. Tomorrow, our guests, Fayetteville, Arkansas. Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, I'd like to say what I thought happened to Reagan dur uh, during the war. He was slightly deaf, and the reason that he was slightly deaf was that he had been a, a, a lifeguard. And as a lifeguard, he had nothing to prove about bravery. 
he saved 75 people from drowning. And uh, don't forget that he who keeps the baggage also serves. Let me ask you, though, again, caller, the issue is, do you, do you get upset with the fact that President Clinton hasn't served? Uh, yes, I do. I have a bumper sticker on the front of my car that reads, A Draft Dodger for as Commander-in-Chief. And on the back, I, I have one that says, Howard Phillips for President in 96. All right, thanks. They sure. seem to be able to decide which, which of Reagan's um, shortcomings, physical shortcomings, kept him out, but I, no one has taken me up on my point. But it's, I know what it's, uh, it brings back to me what it was like arguing with the Reaganites when he was in power. No one will uh, challenge me um, when I say that he twice claimed to have taken part in active service. And no one will challenge me, it seems, when I say I think that's a bit of a disgrace, but with Reaganites, they just don't, they never hear that stuff. And it makes no difference telling them. Which, uh, which one of you is the older? He is. How, what's the difference in age? Two and a half years. You have, oh, are you married and you have children with you here? Yes. How old are the kids? Uh, my daughter's ten and my son is five. How are they doing? Well, it's very different uh, for them from Moscow, where they were before. Um, I, it, it's also st striking for me how very differently Americans uh, raise their children. A friend of ours says Americans raise kids, the British bring up children. And the contrast is enormous. We intend to go back to England, and so I want to bring them up as English children. When my daughter comes home, I don't let her speak American which I see as a completely different language in which people behave in a completely different way. Um, it's actually one of the reasons why I, I often wonder about whether I would in the long term like to stay if the chance came my way. Uh, I'm not en entirely sure that I want to bring my children up as Americans. Needles, California. Needles, California, you're on the air. Hello. Needles, California? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, the problem for Clinton is that he doesn't have any core of support, such as Reagan had, that's going to believe that he did whatever he did. And you have people like uh, Christopher Hitchens, who love to second-guess the president. I mean, Christopher Hitchens isn't going to suffer whether any health care plan goes through. Not really suffer. He has a ton of dough. So does the editor of the New York Times, whose main concern in life is the fine points of fly fishing no matter what he says in his editorials. And this is, this is the problem for Clinton. And as far as Jerry Brown is concerned, I would like to remind Mr. Hitchens about a few things about Jerry Brown. When he was the governor of California, and this was documented in the L.A. Times, he used these state computer systems to, for, for voting, <coughs> for, for re-election. He also sold judgeships, also documented in the, New York, in, in the Los Angeles Times, and he was one of the most obscene fundraisers for the state Democratic Party. And then he gets this, this you know, burst of things so he, can, so he can wreck the candidacy of Clinton. And all of you guys are cheering. You just give up your fancy suit when you decide to be a man of the people. Um, I see why I bring out that reaction in some people. I think it's not true that um, Clinton doesn't have a core of support, actually. I think there are, there are people who will forgive him almost anything. I, I don't know quite why he has this uh, following, but I, but I know that he does have it. Uh, what you say about Brown is new to me. I don't, didn't get your point about the computer. I'd be very surprised to hear he'd sold judgeships, but it's certainly true that when he ran last, he did run as someone who was forever confessing that he'd been um, very involved in the, in the political um, corruption of fundraising, and uh, said that he came came to it, in other words, as a reformed character. The idea of the reformed character is obviously a bit of a dodgy one, but I thought it's better late than never. Um, and I thought he ran a very good campaign on that issue, um, and changed, to some extent at any rate, the way in which people thought about the axiomatic domination of politics by the dollar. And it's keeping it up with what I think is a very good radio show. I think there's always a peril in, in journalists becoming supporters of political figures. Uh, it's much more comfortable and, and much easier and actually <laughs> probably much safer uh, to stay uh, as, as an opponent and critic of all of them. I think the problem that, that Americans have with their political leaders is that they require leaders who are partly kings. And in the case of Reagan, particularly, many people looked upon him as an ideal American monarch and were prepared 
in my view, probably rightly to overlook a huge number of faults because he embodied so very well the kind of America they wanted to have. There are obviously people who feel the same way about Clinton. There is a fax here from Bob Haber of Chicago, Illinois. Three lines. The Hitchens seem so typically British, self-confident and reserved. Might we get a good belly laugh from both of them this morning to prove their human characteristics? Oh, it's a bit early. Um... <laughs> Um, I've barely got my teeth in yet. Um, I don't know. It's being, being told it's time to tell a joke is a bit forbidding, I think. Holland, Michigan. You're next. Yep. Okay, thank you. Hi, you're on the air. I'm on the air now? You're on the air now. Okay. Um, I, I can't hear anybody else, but I think it's rather presumptuous for these gentlemen to be talking about our health care system when they obviously do not understand it. Uh, my husband is a physician. He writes off 47% of his care of patients because he wants to be sure that all people are cared for. And you would be amazed at the number of doctors that do this. Most doctors do this. In the United States, health care is available to people if they need health care. Why is it that so many people are coming from Canada to the United States? We have a very close friend who works, who, a, 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 a person who is a fellow in England in the renal dialysis unit. And he said that in their renal dialysis unit, um, when people reach the age of 55, they come in, and at that time they get a birthday cake and are told they've had a good life. Um, in the United States, we'll do renal dialysis on people who are 80 years old. Don't talk to me about a health care system that runs short on dollars and then figures that people beyond 55, 60 don't have the value of, a, of another person. Thanks. Peter Hitchens? Don't believe the story. Um, and sure. would, 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 would love to hear a chapter and verse on it. Uh, it would make the most amazing scandal in the British press if such a thing were said to anybody. Um, as, as to the rest of it, why, why shouldn't I understand it? After all, I don't have the British National Health Service here. I've had to make my own arrangements. And I found the process extremely frightening. And I've, I've been and visited several hospitals and talked to a large number of doctors, including one doctor who, uh, like your husband, uh, said that he did give free care to his patients but found that his usual reward was to get sued uh, in malpractice cases because people felt that it was their chance in the great American legal lottery uh, to get their slice of the cake and he didn't find it a very edifying experience. No, I don't think your healthcare system stands up to examination and, I, and I'd love to know how many people are coming from Canada to the United States to get healthcare. Maybe this will help uh, the guy from Chicago who thought we were being too pompous and solemn. Or oh, from, it was Illinois, wasn't it? Um, cartoon in the New Yorker a few years ago of um, a fat man standing in a robe and a harp on a cloud talking to um, another guy who'd obviously just got into heaven and saying, well, I did have hate in my heart, but it was for doctors and lawyers and they said that was okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's as good as it gets, Chicago. Deerfield, Sorry, Deerfield yeah, Beach, Florida, go ahead. I felt, I felt some sort of national pride was involved. <laughs> Deerfield Beach, Florida. Go ahead, you're on the air. Good morning, gentlemen. Hi. Uh, Brian, I want to thank you for the D-Day uh, expo that you had. I mm -hmm. was really, really touched. I was only six years old when the war began, uh, but I grew up, and I was 11 at the time of D-Day, and listening to Vera Ellen and watching it was really, really touching. Uh, setting that aside, uh, I saw Mr. Clinton uh, place the wreath at the end of soldier yesterday. And I cried again because I am appalled that this man who protested against our country, uh, it, it's just growing up during the war and watching this man who really protested against this country is different than uh, Christopher Hitchens saying that Reagan did not serve in the, uh, the war. I didn't say okay? he didn't serve. I said he lied about having served. No, right. one, no one will take up my actual point. Come on, Mr. Hitchens. And another thing, Peter. Uh, I've watched you and admired you before, but uh, the fact that you just made a derogatory remark about the Americans, that you Americans just bring up their children and Brits raise them? Is no, that the, other, the other way around. Americans, Americans raise kids, and this isn't my original statement, but it seems to sum it up rather well. Americans raise kids, the English bring up their children. Of bringing up the, the Beatles, and they came here and wrecked our country. That's all I've got. Yeah, I apologize for that. It wasn't my fault. But it was the Rolling Stones who um, wrecked the country. They're also British. 
Clinton did not protest against his country. Um, if you would like, want to take a look at the Haldeman Diaries and see uh, how Nixon and Kissinger discussed um, the waging of that war and the timing of the bombing to affect the election and the deliberate prolonging of the war to save their own skins and how they um, probably were individually responsible for the deaths of maybe 20,000 Americans uh, in the years between 68 and 72 and finally settled on the terms which they had run against in an election which they tried to subvert. Um, you would say it wasn't just your right as an American to protest against that war, but it was your civic duty. And to the extent that Clinton <coughs> took any part in the anti-war movement, he deserves great credit. My, my quarrel with him is he doesn't seem to have the uh, residue of courage from that period um, that would be required to say, as he could have said in response to Reagan's big lie that the Vietnam War was a noble cause, that the anti-war movement was the noble cause, and let's have the national discussion about that. Facts from Sierra Madre, California. Jack Calloway, question to me, uh, is C-SPAN going to be carried on direct TV? We've lost C-SPAN two full time, maybe may be worse to come, thanks to all C-SPAN. The answer is yes, we will be on direct TV, both C-SPAN one and two, and it'll be available nationwide on October the 1st as we go to Ro Little Rock, California. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. I have three comments, Brian. Will you give me time to make them? If Thank you can. I admire Clinton for having the nerve and the courage to protest against Vietnam. Vietnam was the biggest joke that ever was, okay? Now, that's what he done, and you can see his sin written on his forehead. Ronald Reagan, I'm, I'm amazed and appalled at how he has managed to dupe the, us Americans. I'm an Irish-born person, but I live in America for 33 years. He duped this country. He allowed the Japs to walk in and buy us, and then went after he was out of office to collect his check. Also, no one ever mentions the fact that Nancy Reagan went out of office with millions of dollars for just say no to drugs and has done nothing with it but open a big office in Century City and absolutely does nothing with it. You know, I, I, I just, maybe it's British and Irish people, we can see things because we're not directly involved as Americans. But to me, the only thing that, that differs between Clinton and, and, and Reagan as far as what Clinton did, Reagan was an actor. He was the biggest phony that ever hit the president of the United States. And um, we're suffering. We've got homeless on our streets. We've got poverty the likes of you never seen. He started tribalism among our people. Caller, how long have you been here from Ireland? 33 years. All right, thanks. Got your point? Didn't know there was a little rock in California. Oh, yeah. You know now? No, no. You must be pleased to know that there are people out there who are, who are, who are, who are backing you. I, I'm amazed that you say that Clinton has no acting ability. I think the, the president is, is a superb performer, uh, and I, I still like to replay his State of the Union message uh, for the sheer delight of the performance, as opposed to the substance of it. As for Vietnam, I don't know. I protested against it at the time, but l looking back on it, I wonder whether it's e exactly marvelous uh, that Vietnam is now ruled from Hanoi by one of the last Leninist cliques on the face of the earth and is one of the most poverty-stricken and miserable countries in Southeast Asia and whether perhaps there wasn't a cause there uh, that has got forgotten in all the agonizing about whether American kids should have gone to fight in the, in the war. Columbus, Ohio. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? Fine. Uh, I'd like to ask Peter Hitchens a question uh, regarding Iraq. Uh, as I understand it, there was a investigation recently as to uh, oh I've, I've forgotten the name yeah, the Scott inquiry in, 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 the, in, in, the, the in, rearming of Iraq and, that's right yes and and its relationship to the BNL Bank in Atlanta and and my real question is this seems to have been more prominent in the news in England than here in the United States uh, we constantly talk about Bill Clinton's failures in foreign policy, but very little is said about George Bush's role in rearming Iraq, which is far more critical. And, and my real question is, how does the, the sale of futures, which leads to a profit by a first lady, get to be bigger news than the sale of arms that leads to a war? Well, I don't think the sale of arms leads to a war. Uh, the existence of the Saddam Hussein regime in Iraq certainly leads to wars. 
Uh, I think you'll find that most countries in the world, whether it be the former Soviet Union, the present Russia, uh, the United States, France, Britain, uh, South Africa, Israel, uh, that can make money out of selling arms, do so, and will continue to do so wherever they can. Uh, but to, to blame the sale of those arms for the war which follows is absurd. Tom Rizzo of uh, Akron, Ohio, has a fax here. Can I, we can go back to that. I just need okay. to get this in quickly. Uh, invite comments from the Brothers Hitchens on uh, these topics. Labor Party after John Smith, will it ever find its way back to the left? No. Um, it seems to me a pre-ordained uh, fact, that, um, or a pre-ordained conclusion, that the man who's, um, I don't know why he's done it, but he actually claims to have modeled himself on, on Bill Clinton, Michael Tony Blair, is going to win because everyone in the press tells him that's the only way you can win an election. Tony Blair will be the new leader in your He'll opinion. be the new leader of the Party. He'll lose the election. 41 for years old. Yeah, for that reason. R wrong, wrong on both counts, actually. T Tony, um, who, who I know, does not model himself on Clinton, was rather embarrassed by the comparisons made between him and Clinton. Two, he's by no means certain to win the leadership because the Labour Party is, uh, actually has no members to speak of, except a, 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 a small group of, uh, of people who know their right and who are quite capable of picking another losing leader and may well do so in the next few months. Ben Wattenberg and his son Daniel, who is with the American Spectator, Ben Wattenberg is a columnist and has his own program called Think Tank, uh, will be here on Thursday morning. Arlington, Virginia, go ahead, please. Ah, good morning, Brian. Hi. Uh, just a quick uh, preface. I'd certainly don't find either of the Mr. Hitchenses to be supercilious or overly British at all. Uh, living here inside the Beltway, uh, they are just as, just as normal as anybody in politics around here is likely to be found. A quick question for each one of them. For Christopher, I've been a loyal supporter of Ronald Reagan since the mid-80s, and, uh, or excuse me, since the mid-70s, and I am not familiar with the uh, uh, speeches that he refers to. Uh, and I'd like to take him up on his point as to when Mr. Reagan claimed to have served uh, where he didn't or have liberated concentration camps or something of that sort. Uh, uh, can you tell me where this happened? Sure, where? yeah. Um, and I don't blame you for not knowing because it was something that uh, didn't fit into the press coverage because if it was true he was doing this, then <clears throat> all the um, accolades he was getting for being a great communicator would, would look ridiculous, wouldn't they? Um, the occasion where he claimed to have helped to liberate the concentration camps was during a visit by uh, Yitzhak Shamir, who was then the foreign minister of Israel. Uh, Reagan claimed this to Mr. Shamir in the White House. He later claimed it when he was visited by Simon Wiesenthal, the, um, I think, slightly exaggerated uh, uh, Nazi hunter from Austria. Um, I can give you chapter and verse references for both those claims by the, by the then president, if you wish. Do you have a reaction, um, caller? Yeah, I mean, I would certainly have an open mind about it, and it would, uh, uh, if it turned out to be something he said, and not just a, a slip of the tongue reading something. Kind of a slip, wouldn't it? You, you wouldn't, if, if the, if the, either you did help to liberate Dachau or you didn't, would be my view. And if you thought you had and you hadn't, you'd be in some kind of quite severe delusional condition. You're quite right, and, and that would certainly lower uh, the uh, reputation of the ex-president in my mind. Caller, did you happen to see 60 Minutes on Sunday night? Uh, yes, I did, as a matter of fact, about the, the people who claimed to have gotten medals that they didn't. Well, they had the story there about Ronald Reagan telling that story about the C-17 and the Medal of Honor winner, which they said turned out to be fantasy and just came from a movie. Yeah, well, uh, this is certainly possible. I wonder who, I wonder who did his research for him, uh, as we say. I doubt if he did it himself. Okay, thanks. Arling, I'm sorry, uh, we go to San Diego, California. Go ahead, please. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, first off, I'd like to say, Mr. Hitchens, if uh, half the allegations that Mr. Reed and Sapphire and The Economist magazine have made, uh, this uh, Whitewater makes uh, uh, Watergate look like a stroll through the park. But my question is this. The Economist uh, magazine uh, on May 7th printed an article uh, about a gentleman named uh, Dennis Patrick who was uh, um, involved in trading with the Lassiter Company uh, involving uh, uh, some odd $20,000 he was promised. Since then, uh, he's had four attempts on his life and is now underground and hiding. And I'm wondering why this story is not being reported by our press. We have to hear about it in a European magazine. Thanks. Well, um, if I can draw attention yet again to my forthcoming column in Vanity Fair, I do go into the Leicester connection in Arkansas, uh, which is, I think, the least... Uh, noticed aspect of the whitewater entanglement so i hope i can i hope i can uh, look you in the eye and uh, and say that much and i thought the economist story was pretty good um 
Uh, it's not the only place that it's appeared, um, but it's probably the longest uh, take on it. Um, I just have to disagree with you, though, even though I'm trying to boost my own piece, um, in saying that it makes Watergate uh, look like a stroll through the park. So far, it hasn't, I think, approached that for, for criminality. Um, but it's uh, invidious, I think, to seek to compare these different kinds of, of, uh, of scandal because, well, it's a matter of probity, really. Peter Hitchens, uh, regarding D-Day, yesterday a CNN poll indicated that just 19% of the British believes America contributed the most to winning World War II. Are their schools as bad as ours, or do the British see history through a fool's fog? How do you Brits feel about the channel? Uh, well, several points. <laughs> uh, our schools are nearly as bad as yours, um, after a, 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 another mistaken attempt at egalitarianism, and you have to pay a fortune for a good education. Uh, but also, we do tend to believe that we won the war. And you will find, if you go to Russia, that D-Day was a minor uh, landing on the uh, western fringes of Europe at a not particularly convenient moment. Uh, wherever you go, these things are viewed differently. And I'm afraid that uh, that will always continue. I, I've no doubt that a lot of Americans are barely aware that uh, the British took part in, in the D-Day landings, and Canadians are constantly furious about the fact that nobody mentions them. Uh, as for the channel, uh, I think I hate it. Uh, I, I can't see any reason for, for it existing. I, I, I love France enormously, but I'm delighted that there's a patch of water between me and it, and that going anywhere in Europe involves genuinely going abroad and across the sea. Uh, I hope they fill it in, preferably with a leftover tower block from London. Jim Batts of Fort Worth, Texas. I would like to know if the MENA airport rumors mm -hmm. and the accusations made by Larry Nichols against Clinton are making the British press the liberal media, including me, he says, seem to be avoiding this subject even more than they once avoided Paula Jones, Jim Batts, and then he says, deal with it, Brian. Well, it certainly uh, had more play in the British press than it has here. I think probably if you said... What is it? Uh, what's Mina, it all about? If you said Mina Airport to most Americans, they, it would be the first time they heard it, yeah, which I, I think is rather extraordinary. Uh, we did have something... We are concerned. <coughs> yeah, we had something about it in the nation during the election campaign, but again, that was a time when... Clinton was designated moderate, designated front-runner, designated man who, you know, knew how to play by the rules, so none of this stuff was allowed to come up. But um, MENA Airport is an airport in western Arkansas, which was used um, as one of the staging posts for the Contra resupply operation, which was a criminal conspiracy uh, at the time, involving basically the exchange of illegal weapons for illegal drugs. Um, but whereby one lot of thugs in the United States supported um, and trained another lot of thugs in Nicaragua. There's um, a, a blind eye appears to have been turned by Mr. Clinton's administration in Arkansas about, about this, the, uh, the, to this rather, I'm sorry to say. David Fustel of Fort Wayne, Indiana, sends this in. I just want to ask what's going on that we get two faxes from two different parts of the country on this subject. Do you have any comments about the rumors about drug gun running at the MENA airport in Arkansas? Does anybody know where this is coming from? Uh, it just seems to be the conspiracy theory of the month. To me, it's, uh, it, it's, it, it's one of those things where as soon as you see people starting to link Clinton, the CIA, uh, Colombian drug barons, the Contras, you begin to think, well, maybe, just possibly, it, it might be, sooner or later someone may find out in 20 years' time that this is true, but it just seems thoroughly unlikely to me and not the point. Uh, it's, it, it draws attention away from the, from the main issues of, of what happened in Arkansas, which is people behaved in ways which, if they were legal, were certainly not terribly ethical. Jackson, Mississippi, thanks for waiting. Thank you. Good morning. Morning. Uh, I'm going to speak from the heart this morning like I normally do, but the reason I'm calling is, Mr. Hitchens, I really believe that conspiracies are a fact because these people in power are not going to allow things to happen without orchestrating things ahead of time. They don't just allow things just to fall on them and happen. And I think what's happening with C-SPAN, losing C-SPAN in certain parts of the country, my fellow Americans, we better wake up. C-SPAN is our only true, honest voice in this country. And the little bits of the country that C-SPAN is losing, these people in power are not going to take C-SPAN off the air right away. They're going to do it bit by bit. They're going to edge away at it because C-SPAN is making a difference. And it's making a difference in our attitudes. We're getting the, the truth, the facts about the things that have happened around the world. The Palestinians, for instance, the things that we've been fed through the media, through for special interest groups. We're getting facts on C-SPAN. If you glean what people say 
and do research on your own. And I'll tell you, we need to call our congressman because something's happening. And I would like C-SPAN to be taken over by the federal government, un unbiased, unpartisan, and let Brian Lamb become a federal employee. And we can get a, a more honest feed on what is happening around the world because we are not getting it from these publications and from the network media. Thanks. Don't know where to start with that one. I think we should take it as a comment. Uh, it wasn't a question, anyway. But then you'll enjoy this comment from E. Tiran, <clears throat> Tian, excuse me, of Lewisburg, Tennessee. Brian, maybe you should do a weekend of Revolutionary War highlights so we can all remind ourselves why we parted ways with these supercilious snobs in the first place. The warning today would be one if by land, two if by sea, three if by TV. <laughs> Fair enough. But I, I would like to claim the American Revolution as part of an English Revolution all the same. It was basically a revolution of um, highly educated English people against uh, a German monarchy um, and its German um, surrogate uh, forces uh, in America. The sad thing to me is that the German monarchy still remains in England and the American Revolution is to that extent incomplete. But I, but I very much admire the spirit and to some extent the letter of that um, that fact. Supercilious snob. Do you, do you buy that? No, absolutely. I mean, you, well, you, you, you just, can tell just by looking compass. at us that we're, we're all supercilious snobs. The trouble, the trouble with the Americans is that they're, they're constantly having masterpiece theatre rammed down their throat. Uh, as the New York Times rightly pointed out last week, if they could see real British TV, they could realise uh, what a tremendous minority the supercilious snobs are and how uh, the real Brit, whom they would have seen if uh, only England had a team in the World Cup is very different from, uh, from Christopher and me. By, by the way, is snooker real British TV? I'm afraid it is, yes. Sure. Yep. Since colour television arrived, though all those coloured balls whirling around make a very nice picture on them. Mountain Lakes, New Jersey. Go ahead, please. Oh, hello. I would like to exhort both Messrs Hitchens to continue being supercilious snobs. It's very amusing. I'm enjoying it tremendously. I've lived in um, England and parts of Europe for the past 25 years been dragged kicking and screaming back to my homeland by my husband's work. Um, I've had excellent care under the National Health Service in Britain and several other um, socialized medical services. Um, I would like to know what your guests would feel could be learnt from the present state of the British health system which could um, aid America setting up a good or perhaps even better system. Clear it up for us, so where are you? Where are you from? What do you call homeland? I was born in the United States, but have lived much of my life in England. Thanks. Gentlemen? Well, I haven't, I haven't, though I was brought up on um, free uh, black currant juice and, and milk, which was given to all English children, um, and abolished the deficiency disease problems of rickets and other calcium deficiency uh, afflictions that have been such a big feature of English life before the Second World War. I don't have any real-time um, knowledge of how the National Health Service is now doing. I just think that it, it's, it's a, a very plain statement of principle that any advanced and civilized country should treat people according not to how well off they are, but how sick they are. And um, I've no doubt that be the, that would need some adaptation for American conditions, but it, that is the principle on which um, we were brought up, and uh, which we take for granted. And um, wouldn't give up for anything, and nor would the United States if it could instate the principle in the first place. I think the fundamental lesson is that if you have a viable private health system, as Britain did before the National Health Service, you need a great deal of political courage and direction to achieve a, a health service which is open to everybody. We were very lucky in that the man who set this up, Nye Bevan, was able to make the case for such a system, not merely to the public, but also to the doctors, and persuade them that their position would not be threatened by it. In fact, private medicine survives in Britain and does very well, and it's largely because of that that the health service has lasted as long as it has. Misguided attempts to drive private medicine underground and to force it out of the health service have actually led to a rather sad growth in private medicine in Britain in the past few years, which is undermining the quality of the health service. Pasadena, California. Good morning, Brian. Uh, things are picking up now. Christopher's almost awake. I think by the end of the show, he'll be with us. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm calling uh, uh, to, uh, to defend uh, Clinton on the um, anti-war issue. I agree with Christopher. He should, he should have uh, taken his opportunity early uh, to be as eloquent as he was in that letter that was released uh, 
um, that he didn't want to go off to Vietnam to kill people and, and thought that the war was immoral. I, I think if he had said that. What I would like to hear in this week before D-Day is some veterans um, like my late father, who by the time my, my brother was of uh, draft age towards uh, the end of Vietnam, I think was about prepared to break his kneecaps rather than send him off, even though he had been a, my father had been a Marine, and to him draft avoidance was the worst possible thing in the world. Um, I think that he would have, you know, run him to Canada or broken his kneecap. So I'd like to hear from some of those veterans. I know that they had sons who didn't go to Can- uh, who didn't go to Vietnam, who perhaps went to Canada. And I think that uh, that the that the hostility bubbling underneath um, uh, uh, spoils everything. I just uh, a, a small uh, so point. I remain in my torpor. You, you had a, a, a wonderful picture you were holding up a few minutes ago, I think from USA Today, of, of uh, the president standing beside a general singing uh, the national anthem with almost unbelievable vigor. Uh, this is not a man who looks as if he spent very much time avoiding going to Vietnam. I don't think he believes now that he should have done it. And I think that, uh, that is in some ways why he's so open to criticism. If, 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 he, if he stuck by it, if, on the other hand, he'd, he'd done it in a more straightforward way, but as I said, he did not do it in a straightforward way. Now he pretends that he's, he's more patriotic than the generals. I think he's always going to be in a fix about this. And I'm interested, I've been trying to convince myself, because as, um, ev- everyone in Washington says you should be careful not to let your, your own opinions take over. I've been trying to convince myself that he is, in fact, going to be a successful candidate in 1996. But I begin to see signs, especially in the, in the weekend opinion polls, that people are perhaps beginning to look at him as a one-term president. And I think this may be a, a, a major f- factor in this. Can I, Kent, Ohio, go ahead, please. Yeah, Brian, hi. You have a wonderful show. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, in response to Christopher Hitchin and uh, Ronald Reagan's service, I looked it up in uh, An American Life, which is his autobiography, and uh, he talks about getting uh, um, his draft notice, immediate action, and then he went, and it was his eyes, but then he was confined to continental limits, eligible for core area service command or war department overhead. And he served as a, a, an officer, a liaison officer, for a few months, and then went to the Army, or Army Air Corps Intelligence. Actually, he was a second lieutenant, wore second lieutenant bars, and, he, and it says in here, I was wearing bars of a second lieutenant. I was offering majors and seniors to half a million dollar a year directors and they went on to make uh, movies then. And then, if you read on further, this is like page 97 of his autobiography. It says, uh, during the final months of the war, we began receiving secret single core films showing the liberation of Hitler's death camp, and they engraved images on my mind. That might be where you heard that, but I, I never heard that Ronald Reagan said that uh, he liberated death camps. Not my fault that you haven't heard, but you've heard now. By the way, J. Durbin and T. Durbin uh, 602 area code say the World Almanac and Book of Facts 1994 states on page 478 Ronald W. Reagan he was a captain in the Air Force during World War II where do their facts come from? Yeah, no, no one says he wasn't in the uh, actually was in the, the movie making uh, end of um, of the army made training films that kind of thing um, well, no one says he didn't what, what I'm saying till I'm tired, uh, is that he claimed to have done a great deal more than that on several occasions on the record. And that I can prove to anybody. Amarillo, Texas. Thank you, Brian. Uh, One quick comment, Christopher. As far as uh, the uh, legal implications of Watergate versus uh, Whitewater, I think Vince Foster might make a differ with you there. Uh, I was calling, uh, I'm a proud owner of an FNFAL, which uh, had the distinction of serving both sides in the Falklands War, a semi-automatic assault weapon, if you will, that is soon to be banned here in this country, and uh, has been in, in the Great Britain for several years now. And I was wondering how you feel the effects of gun control uh, would affect uh, the role of terrorism here as it has uh, abroad, uh, seeing as that we don't really have that many... Uh, bo- Peter Hitchens. Well, I, I think gun control is, is possibly the most ludicrous and, and phony political issue uh, available in any country in the world today. In, in a nation where, as far as I know, there are 200 million guns in private hands, 
the idea of controlling them is uh, about as realistic as controlling umbrellas. It isn't going to happen, and those who pretend that it is are duping themselves and the public. Uh, I think America missed its chance on gun control many years ago and went instead for prohibition, which uh, only served to, um, to spread the use of guns. Uh, we have a problem in Britain that guns are now beginning to enter the country uh, in fairly large numbers, uh, that armed crime is on the increase, and that we are beginning to arm our police, which is a tragedy, but at least we do have uh, the possibility of genuine gun control at this early stage. You don't. Gardena, California. Uh, yeah, um, I have one, uh, one comparison I'd like to, I'd like to talk about. Um, between, uh, South Africa and the blacks and white situation there, uh, Israel and Palestine, and the English and the Irish. What, what? How do you guys feel about that? Okay. Uh, uh, what particular aspect of it? Well, he's not on the line um, so again, and I just want to show you, though, it's in the news this morning. Uh, there's several stories. As a matter of fact, here's the L.A. Times. Palestinians faced with cash crisis. So he's talking about the Palestinian problem over in, uh, drop this, uh, there's also an editorial in the Washington Post that Sinn Féin's stall. This is all about waiting for the European elections on June the 9th. So the issues that he's talking about, he's talking about are all over the papers. What, what I think he was trying to say was that these were three colonial or semi-colonial comparisons. I, I don't think the, there's a, any very exact comparison to be made between any two of those, let alone all three. Oddly um, enough, there is, there, is, there is one strong parallel, that in all cases there is a group of people, uh, a, usually a politically unpopular and incorrect group of people, uh, on the territory involved, uh, which doesn't want to leave and is challenged by another local nationalism. And that in, in all three countries, uh, this has led to different forms of conflict and compromise. Uh, and in probably in all three of them, it will eventually lead to disaster. The, 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 the South African problem is that the whites are not colonial whites, they are, they are white Africans who have no intention of going anywhere and have nowhere to go if they wanted to. In Northern Ireland, the, the Protestant majority, which is going to become a minority and will probably take to terrorism on its own account. And in Israel, a group of people who arrived there mainly as a result of the Balfour Declaration in 1917 and who were not going to go, uh, but who are surrounded, especially under present American foreign policy, uh, by hostile and unreliable states which are being forced into uh, rather temporary looking agreements with them. We're going to take a total of two more calls. This one from Fairfax, Virginia next and then one more. Go ahead, please. Good morning, uh, Brian. I feel Hi. honored to be uh, second to last caller this morning. Welcome. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Hitchens, I had uh, uh, originally Which a question one? and I, I wanted to add on um, uh, one other one. Um, Iraq. Uh, we had uh, two helicopters shot down there about 60 days ago, and I believe the Pentagon uh, promised uh, some sort of a report uh, analyzing the shoot-down and the whys and wherefores. I haven't seen anything on that. Do you, uh, as kind of an insider, have any idea what the status of that report is? I wish I could say that I had. No, but it didn't seem to me that it would need a very exhaustive inquiry. I mean, I think all the main facts were, were acknowledged um, on more or less on the same day, that uh, it was a an appalling uh, failure of aircraft recognition. Um, and in other words, the, the shoot down was done by of American servicemen and um, actually some other uh, Western European officers. And I think some Kurds was done by um, American planes. I, uh, I, I, it's, it's I, 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 I thought it was really awful. I think one of the best things that the United States is doing at the moment is providing the the, protect, the military protection under which the, the Kurds are succeeding in, um, though not without great difficulty, in, in developing a limited autonomy and independence for the first time in their, uh, in their long and, and very bitter struggle for freedom. I did check up on this last week and, and nothing is apparently imminent. I'm also puzzled that it's taking so long. It does seem to be a fairly straightforward case. There were, there were British officers aboard the helicopter and uh, Britain has a strong interest in, in getting an answer to this question as well. Uh, Philip James of Park Ridge, Illinois. I'm curious, does the BBC allow American journalists to bash current and former British leaders, etc.? Yeah. yeah. And please tell that chap from Vanity Fair that he may wind up in the U.S. healthcare system if he continues seeking medals, awards for alcohol consumption. He looks rather ill. <laughs> Um, that's it? <laughs> Is that, that's you it. saved that for last? Well, no, I just got it. <laughs> no chance. 
Well, at least I uh, can be said to be wearing it on my sleeve or my lapel. Kansas City, Missouri, you're next. Good morning, Brian. Hi. Uh, I just want to ask the gentleman if, uh, as far as the MENA Arkansas thing with Clinton, I'm originally from Arkansas, and I know it happened, or I knew, I know several people that were somewhat involved, and they were allowed to retire from public office. Is this going to be swept under the rug? Or And second question. Why do you think that draft Dodgers like, uh, say, for instance, Jackson Brown, uh, Clinton, the, uh, uh, what is it, Hanoi Jane, why do you think they can go and make millions of dollars, you know, basically dra dodging the draft, they come back, make millions of dollars off the American people? Why do you think this is so? Thank you. I've never heard Jane Fonda call a draft Dodger before. I've heard it called many things. Uh, by the way, on the other issue of, Stupid question. of the MENA, Arkansas situation, here's, a, here's another fact. This is from Bangor, Maine, from Todd Foy. Ask your guests what they think about the book that Jerry Reed wrote relating to the MENA airport um, and Bill Clinton's administration turning a blind eye to it. Jerry Reed was a pilot in the operation, was hunted along with his family by our government because they did not want him going public about it. Also in this book, it is alleged, along with other credible sources, that Foster was murdered. Word has it that Fisk is following a paper trail relating to Foster's death that's part of leading to the MENA airport, MENA, Arkansas airport. Yeah, I mean, I get, I get quite a lot of letters like this, too. Very often, I'm afraid to say, written in green ink, um, which are inclined to the view, which is always suspicious and to be guarded against, that everything's connected to everything else. And I, do, I also believe there is such a thing as conspiracy. Um, and I, I think it's wrong to believe that the, there is no such thing. I think the term conspiracy theory is too often used to put an end to inquiries, but there, are, there is also such a thing as paranoia. And I'm afraid to say that a lot of the anti-Clinton uh, letter writers and um, so on are suffering from that. I got a fax here for Peter Hitchens from the Blue Mouse Studio. They. Rex Snyder. The last time you were on, you pretended not to know the meaning of homophobia. I don't think you should be allowed to get away with that. It betrays your own homophobia to not recognize the insanity behind the cruel treatment of a segment of the human family that contributes so much, including, by the way, war efforts. Perhaps your brother can elaborate. Well, well th thanks for the chance to, 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 to go back on that. I was half asleep and made a complete mess of the, of the point that I was making. Um, the, word, the word simply means uh, fear of the same and is therefore pretty much meaningless. As for, as for whether there is such a thing, um, you, <laughs> isn't it, is, is there some point at which we say that some forms of sexual behavior are unacceptable? Um, do we, for instance, say that uh, child molesting is okay? If not, why not? Uh, do we, were we wrong to draw the line at homosexuality as something that, that, that we approved of? Were, are we right now to say that it's fine? Is it all right for um, authors uh, in rose embowered cottages and wrong for, for, for convicts in prison to get up to it? It's a discussion which is worth having, uh, but it's a discussion which is not, not being had. At the moment, homosexuality is something which is, which is accepted without question, whereas 20 or 30 years ago it was denounced without question. I can't help believing that there is a debate to be had about whether it's a good or a bad thing, and we're not having it at the moment. Um, as the one who crowed over Peter after that show, saying you've got homophobia wrong, it means fear of the same. Um, I also have a, a doubt that it's the right word, uh, because fear of the same is not really what's intended um, by those who wish there to be a word, which I think there should be, for people who, who are uh, bigoted about homosexuality. It could, in fact, be, well, if we went into it far enough, that, the, that homophobia would accidentally turn out to be the right word, because I have noticed in those who are extremely um, prejudiced against homosexuality that there is an insecurity about their own uh, sexual standing, um, very often a fear that they are themselves homosexual. Um, and ironically, therefore, homophobia might turn out to be the right word. For the moment, though, I think we could do with a better one Last to describe prejudice on its own. We only have a few moments. Last fact from Conway, Arkansas. Why did these two guys come to America simply to critique everyone? We in Arkansas are the, over, the ones left over, it's, it's, this is not a totally, uh, uh, some words left out, the lowest in everything, education, et cetera. Can these two not get jobs in their country and take their kids with them? Well, 
Well, I have a job in my country, and the job that I have in my country is to come here and report on, on this one. And uh, I intend to return to it. And uh, as, uh, as for the other point, if, if there were nothing to criticize, then I'm sure I wouldn't criticize it. And you're very welcome at any time to come to my country and uh, criticize it. And now, now how do you feel about our strange facts writers? Um, it's strange, though, because I don't think a single question, um, and we went pretty much around the union this morning from callers and factors, invited us to uh, be other than critical um, about the president or um, the political system. So had you uh, wanted us to say something nice, you only needed to have asked. You both were born in Portsmouth, England? I was. Peter was born in Malta. I'm sorry. That's right. We talked about that last time. Mm -hmm. Now, you went to the University of York and you went to Cambridge and Oxford. I went to Oxford, yeah, with, uh, actually at the same time as the prayers.